Jesus has an infinite number of sins that you have committed against him and his father. And they have started when you were conceived, and they will go to the point of your natural death. Jesus has an endless list of offenses that you have done against him. And he says that if you come to him, you will find him merciful, gentle, humble of heart. In other words, Jesus doesn't gunny sack. Jesus is ready to give you rest. You know, if you think about the fact that Jesus said here that those who come to him come because the Father draws them, and you think to yourself, can I possibly believe that Jesus will receive me and my sin? Can I possibly go to him? I am such a piece of work. I'm such a piece of work. There's so much sin in my life. Can I possibly come to him? And then you think that he says that those who come to him, come to him because God has chosen to reveal himself to the poor and the stupid, the ignorant, to the people of no, people like the Israelites, the Jews, who were nothing, and that's why God chose them. That's what the Old Testament tells us. And you think about this, and you think, well, how do I know if God will receive me? And I say, well, because he says, come. And you say, yeah, but what if I'm not one of the chosen? Here, here's, some of you are probably tormented by that. You have this little game you play like the clover, you know, the daisies. He loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. And you try to see which one comes out. You know what I'm saying? I guess you have to be OCD like me to do this kind of thing. but So you play this game with God. He loves me, he loves me not. I'm called, I'm chosen, I'm not chosen, I'm not called. And let let me just ask you the question. If you don't know whether or not God has chosen you, has it ever occurred to you that you just come anyhow? I mean, think about it. If he hasn't chosen you, but he says, come, come. Say to him, God, I know you haven't chosen me, but I be coming. I mean, do you understand this? If you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, all you have in you is this tiny, tiny little thing like, I don't care, I'm not going to go to Satan, I'm going to go to God. And if God curses me, I'll go to him anyhow because I love him. And then God says, I, 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 I didn't predestine you. What kind of a monster do you think God is that he makes a promise to you to come and that he will give you rest? You know, I think about these things about myself. I think about this. And you know what I think? Here's, here's the way I've resolved it. I think, am I chosen? And then I think to myself, I don't care. I would rather spend eternity rejected by God than one moment embracing Satan. (laughs) In other words, I'd rather live my life under God's judgment coming to him than um, the tiniest unit of time possible turning my back on the only hope I have for eternity. You know, why would I ever go over there? I don't want Satan. I don't want hell. I don't want sin. And so if God rejects me, he's going to be rejecting me with me coming. You know, I'm going to come. That's faith. That's faith. It doesn't look glamorous. It doesn't look clean. It's not Dutch. It's just, I will not allow him to turn away from me. I'll be facing him, and if he shoves me to hell, he'll shove me to hell with me saying, I love him. Does this make sense to you? This whole thing about predestination is to God's glory, but it's not to your depression and discouragement and hopelessness. If you hear him saying, come, you face him and you go. And yes, you're going to make a total horse's petition of yourself. 
That's the nature of the Christian faith. As you come, you'll fall on your face and you'll kick other people in the shins and you'll, you'll hurt your children and you'll hurt your wife. And you go, you go because what? He said, come. And so you go. I've told you this before and I'll end. When I was with my mother up at Mayo, God had been merciful and told me that my father was going to die in that surgery. Sometimes God will tell you things like this. And so they told us he was off the bypass machine and my mother was hopeful and I was with her and Mary Lee had taken Michael to do something back at the room so Mary Lee and Michael weren't there. And, uh, I, you know, they said you're going to be able to come in and see him, you know, and you just have this surreal thing where you know it's not going to work. <laughs> He's going to die because God told that to you. And sure enough, after about half an hour of us anticipating going in to see him, they come to us and they say, something's gone horribly wrong. Your father has, has gone into uh, cardiac arrest. They've opened him back up in the recovery room. They're tr- desperately trying to bring him back. And he, he, come on over. So they took us over to the room. And then I've told you this chaplain, this godless, godless, wicked man named a chaplain came in the room and began to tell me that I had every right to be angry at God. Now, mind you, there wasn't the slightest indication in me that I was angry at God, not the slightest. So he was just talking about himself. He wasn't helping me. And my mother's wailing and my father's dying. And there was a commercial, Michael Fox did, some of you will remember it, where he was did a public service commercial against drugs. He walks through a bunch of doors, and as he walks through the doors, they slam behind him. If you do drugs, slam door. Then your life will be slam door. Steadily growing more imprisoned, slam door, until all of a sudden he's right in front of you, and the last door has slammed, and there's no place left to go because you've done drugs and your life is over, and that's the point of the commercial. And I remember thinking to myself, this is me right now. There's all these doors in front of me, and to the right, it was kind of a compression of different images, but to the right is love of God, to the left is hatred of God. And this is a life-defining moment for me because I really love my dad. So I'm sitting there, and my mother's crying. My wife isn't there. And this damn chaplain is seducing me to turn from God. And I looked in my heart, and what I realized was that I couldn't conceive, no matter the pain, no matter the disappointment that I could not conceive of ever not coming to God. It was very clear to me at that moment, he was the one giving me this pain. He was the one giving my mother her pain. There was no fate. It was a personal thing. This was God that gave me that moment, that gave me death, that was taking my father from me. There was no question in my mind. And the question was, would I love him as he disciplined me? And you say, oh, no, don't say discipline. All right, punished. Is that better? God was taking my father from me. He knew my love, and he took him. He knew my mother's love. He took him. And the question was, would I give in to this horrible, wicked religious man and be angry at God? Or would I say, though he slay me, I will serve him. I don't want to, com- I won't want to compare myself to Job at all. But you understand what I'm saying. And th- at that moment, what I realized in my heart was that I would rather have my wife taken, my children taken, my father taken, my mother taken. I would rather starve to death, okay? I would rather lose everything that I care about in life and love God then be given one of them back and turn from 
the one who says, I will give you rest. Do you understand that? When he says he'll give you rest, he'll give you rest. You don't have to figure your life out. You don't have to work it in such a way that you have a husband who's better than your father. You come. And then everything that comes to your life is his rest. If he convicts you of sin, guess what? Conviction of sin is rest. You go, oh, no, no, that's a bottomless pit. I've, I've rejected that. I won't do that anymore. I say, okay, you won't have rest. Your entire life will be spent trying to avoid the bottomless pit. <laughs> I mean, does that look like a prison? I won't look at the pit. <laughs> he says what? Come on, you should have it in your brain by now. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden and what? I will give you rest. He'll give you rest. He'll give you rest. And I could look at every single one of you. I know your sins. Do you know what the calling of a pastor is? I'm supposed to help the Holy Spirit. So you know what this means? I go to you, to you, to you, to you, to you, and I convict you of sin. That's my purpose. I'm to convict you of sin so that you will go to him and get rest. Okay, and I look at you and I say, you, 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 come to him. He'll give you rest. I promise you. And listen, don't worry about bringing your sin to me and the elders and pastors and our wives. Bring it. Because then we get to show you the rest, the rest that God has for you. We already know you're a sinner. You're not hiding it from anyone. (laughs) I mean, really. You guys are hopeless. You think you're so sophisticated and you're hiding your sin. I mean, it's just like... You know, it's just like everybody else sees it. Trust me. (laughs) So, So don't hide it and don't try to escape it and don't medicate it with religion or drugs or pornography. Come. And he says he'll give you rest. Our Father, we thank you that you have seen fit to hide this from the rich and the influential. And the wise. And that you have revealed it to me, a fool. And so, Father, I, I pray that today as I made a fool of myself that this stupidity will become salvation to the souls here who are timid and yet who will come. Father, send your Holy Spirit to convict us of sin, that we will forget what lies behind and press on, that we will come and that we will find rest. We love you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We adore you. You are our hope. Thank you for meeting us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.